Good morning, everyone. Glad for you to join us for our, our virtual worship today. As uh, God calls us to come and worship, it's because we need it. There's something higher above ourselves that we need to acknowledge come before, and that's God. And as uh, that great reminder for us, uh, for us to really reflect on, comes from Psalm 103 and uh, verses one through two. And here's how it reads for us. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Friends, would you join me in a word of prayer? Abba, Father, as David calls us to bless your name, I imagine it's not some sort of uh, cheery, sentimental, um, feel-good uh, statement. But rather, it's a reminder for all of us that in a world that makes us so self-absorbed about how we are being taken care of or what's happening to us, to bless you, to bring you praise is a way for us to acknowledge that you are great. You are what's truly greater in our lives. And we pray that that will be the conviction of our hearts as we come before you to bless your name, regardless of what it is that we're going through, to acknowledge you in our lives. And that when we do that, Lord, would you bring and instill a, a sense of peace and security that our God is good. And so that's the kind of worship we ask for today. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. into order who makes the orphan a son and daughter the king of glory the king of glory who rules the nations with truth and justice shines like the sun in all of his brilliance the king of glory the king above all kings yeah this is amazing grace take my place, that you would bear my cross, you would lay down your life, that I would be set free, oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me. Take 
take my place Let you bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me my sails, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my son. Let the King of be the fire inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my son. Let's sing that again. Let the King of be the wind inside my sails. Let me tell 
Dear God, we come before you this morning, um, although we are still on Zoom and although we um, can't hear um, each other's voices and um, sense each other's presences, God, um, in a physical sense, God, I pray that we come before you to, um, to uh, today, this morning, together, united as one congregation. Uh, we come before you, God, to truly declare that without you, we are nothing, um, that 
that we, uh, that you truly deserve all of our lives. Um, you who gave us life, you who gave us real, true life, eternal life, through what you, uh, through what you did through your Son. Um, Jesus, we just thank you and we glorify you and worship you this morning for what you have done for dying on that cross for our sins, for paying it all for us, paying the price that we could not pay, um, and dying on that cross for our sins so that truly that we can be um, in in a relationship uh, with with you and with the, with the Father. Um, so we we just take this time and we um, we acknowledge you this morning. Um, we glorify you and worship you this morning. Um, and God, as we um, continue with the rest of our service, God, would you truly be with um, every part of it? Uh, would you be with your servant Daniel as he delivers your message? Um, may we, may we, may our hearts and our minds may it be good soil um, that the word would be able to plant um, fruit and seeds into into uh, into into us as a um, as a church. Um, God, as we, would you just truly speak to us, and would you would it uh, truly uh, transform how we live in our daily lives? Would it refresh us? Um, so thank you, God, once again for this time. Just stand pray. Amen. Um, now it brings us to the time of repentance for our uh, sins. And I, I understand it, it, it's a little bit of a non sequitur for a lot of us, because why do we go from praise to talking about something grim, such as repentance for our sins? But the thing is, we need this. It's a daily rhythm for our lives to acknowledge that we need forgiveness, that there's areas in our lives that are spiritually, um, what's the word, maybe just eating us away slowly. And this call for repentance is really a heart check for all of us. And so we're going to look at Psalm 103 once again uh, for, to help us to reflect on, on how we should repent for our sin silently. And it's just the second part of verse two, and it reads this way. And forget not all his benefits. Forget not all his benefits. Because you and I, we have a bias for everything that's wrong in our lives or everything that could potentially go wrong. And we forget to acknowledge everything that is right about who God really is and what God has done for us. Can you take this time to silently confess in all the ways that you forget to acknowledge God's goodness in your life. Please take some time to do so silently. Father God, as we come before you, we acknowledge that we all have spiritual dementia. How the more we get older, the more we seem to forget your goodness towards us. And yet every week we need this great reminder that your grace overflows and abounds all the more. It sounds so ridiculous. Yet at the same time, it leaves us without words that you can be this compassionate towards us. We pray and ask, Father, as we come before you, help us to constantly bless you, to remember that the cross is your reminder to us. You will never undo what you have done for us, saving us from our sins, forgiving it all, but also giving to us a righteousness that comes from Jesus to remind us that this life is not all that there is. There is a resurrected life you have in store for us. And your words of grace remind us, Lord, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As a father shows compassion to his children, so the Lord shows compassion to those who fear him. Thank you for being a compassionate father. 
And as, you're your, as you are our Father, teach us constantly what it means to live for you, but also what it really means to pray to you. As we now all take this time to pray together in unison, the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we give our debtors. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and glory forever. Amen. Uh, we'd also like to take this time to confess what it is that we believe. We've been going through the Heidelberg Catechism, and what we believe about these catechisms is that they are a good uh, snapshot, an outline of what, what the Bible really teaches. And so uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask the question, and then if you could all respond in unison, wherever you're at, the answer, uh, that would be lovely. Here we go. Question 48. But are the two natures in Christ not separated from each other? If his human nature is not present wherever his divinity is? Answer, not at all. For his divinity has no limits and is present everywhere. So it must follow that his divinity is indeed beyond the human nature which he has taken on and nevertheless is within the human nature and remains personally united with it. And now if you could all open up your Bibles to John chapter 4, uh, sorry, I, I don't have the verses on me, John chapter 4, it's a nice lengthy passage, uh, and uh, Mr. Daniel, our pastor, pastoral intern for our youth group, who uh, has done a wonderful job with our students here, is going to come up and deliver God's word to us, and so it's a great treat, uh, and so as we invite him up to come speak, he's going to speak a message entitled, The Hope That We Need. Why don't we all give a nice warm round of Zoom applauses in our icons now as we welcome Daniel up here. Thank you, Pamus, for that. Uh, thank you all for, uh, yeah, for these nice little clap emojis. Uh, good morning and welcome to Hope Church. And as, as Pastor Amos said, my name is Daniel. I serve as the pastoral intern for our youth ministry. And today it's my privilege to bring you God's word. And so during the pandemic, uh, we've been meeting online for our Sundays, as well as our various meetings. And during the Men of Hope Bible studies, which we've been doing on Wednesday nights, we were studying the Gospel of John. And as we came over this passage, I felt that it would be a useful reflection for all of us today. Because this story, John 4, it deals with hope, both hope lost and hope renewed. You see, this is a time when school is ending, summer is starting, a lot of transitions. Even California is expected to open up this week. And as we look forward to what the future holds, we have to ask ourselves, what are the various hopes that we're holding on to? Moreover, as our church being called Hope Church and our mission being to share our hope in Christ, what does that really mean? Why is it so vital for us and for all who need the gospel. And so my desire for us today is that we would see that Christ alone and Christ alone is our great hope, which we need. And so if you turn with me to John chapter four, I'll be reading from verses one through 30. It's a long passage. And then we're gonna skip to verses 39 to 42. So John chapter four, verse one, all the way to 30 and then 39 to 42. And let us give this our careful attention for this is the reading of God's holy word. Starting from verse one. Now, when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee and he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, how is it that you, a Jew, Ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria. 
for Jews had no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, sir, you have nothing to draw water with and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to her, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Verse 16, Jesus said to her, go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. And Jesus said to her, you are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshiped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. We worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for our salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. And the woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. He was called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you and he. Just then, his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with the woman, but no one said, what do you see? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into the town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. And then skipping to verse 39, many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it's no longer because of what you said that we believe, but we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. This is the word of God. Would you join me now in prayer as we ask for God's blessing in our time together? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we have heard your word read, we ask now that you would bless the preaching of your word. Would your spirit be with us now to give us eyes to see your glory, ears to hear the gospel, and hearts to receive the hope that we truly need. Help us now. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we're diving right into the Gospel of John. This is John chapter 4, but we need to understand the Gospel as a whole before we dive into this specific story. Because John actually tells us what he, why he's writing this Gospel all the, way back in, all the way back in John 20, the end of the Gospel, where he says in John 20, 31, I'm writing these things so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And so John wants all his audience to come to faith in Christ. And so John, right before our passage, John chapter 3, Jesus talks with Nicodemus, a Pharisee, a teacher of the Jews, and he teaches him that one must be born again to have eternal life. One must believe in Christ and that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. And so Jesus talked with this Jewish leader in John chapter three, and now we come to our text, John chapter four, where we meet some of the complete opposite of this Jewish leader. You see, Nicodemus in John three was a Jewish man who was well-respected, named, but he comes at night. Meanwhile, this woman of Samaria, we don't even know her name, 
we find out that she was rejected by her own people and that she comes in the middle of the day. And so John is showing us with this contrast that it's not so much about the persons that come to meet Jesus, but it is Jesus who is the Messiah that will save all, whether Jew or non-Jew, all who believe will be saved. And so the main point for our time together is this, that it is Jesus, that Jesus gives the living water, which fills us with the hope we need. And so we'll look at this passage, this long passage in three points. First, we're going to consider the water that we need. Second, we'll look at the water that we had. And third and finally, we'll look at the water we received. The water we need, had, and received. Because Jesus is the one that gives us the living water, which fills us with the hope we need. And so let's turn to our first point, the water we need. You see, in verses one through six, John is setting up this divine appointment. This is like the introduction to any TV episode that you have, where it sets up the story and the plots. When Jesus was in Judea, the Pharisees hear that he's growing, that Jesus' ministry is growing. And so in order to avoid this conflict, Jesus goes from Judea to Galilee. Judea to Galilee. And it says in verse four that he had to pass through Samaria. See, Judea to Galilee is like making the trip up from UCSD all the way to Anaheim. And so when you're going up that way, taking the five freeway, you have to pass through Oceanside. You know, it's, it's on the way, but it's not completely necessary. You could actually get from UCSD to Anaheim by going around through the 15 and coming back. So it's not necessary that he has to go through here. But what John is saying in verse four is that it was necessary. It was divinely appointed that Jesus had to go through Samaria. And so he goes up there with his disciples and he rests at this well that's attributed to Jacob. This Jacob's well while his disciples go out into the city to buy food. And this is John again setting up, alluding back to Genesis 29, when Jacob encountered his to-be wife, Rachel, at a well. And so already we're anticipating that Christ is looking for someone. He had to come here. He's pursuing somebody and he's waiting at this well. But what we find out is that though Jesus was looking for someone, that someone was not looking for Jesus. See, in verse 7, we're introduced to this woman from Samaria who comes not to meet him, but to draw water. And this is quite an unusual time to draw water because we find out that Jesus is there at the sixth hour from verse six, which is noon. For them, this is right when the sun is at the peak and this is the hottest time of the day. Normally, women would come out early in the morning to avoid the heat and they did so in groups as a kind of a social activity. But clearly this woman is trying to avoid these people as she comes at this very hot time to get water. And so when Jesus asks for water, the woman is genuinely surprised. She didn't come trying to meet anyone. And moreover, this person is not someone who should be talking to her. We read in verse nine that she asked, how is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? Jesus is crossing two lines here. First, that a man is talking to a woman in public. But secondly, and more significantly, during that time, that the Jews, that a Jew was talking to a Samaritan. And John clues us in that the Jews did not have any dealings with Samaritans because they just were completely separate. This is as if in a modern day example, if Jesus went through a fence that was clearly labeled no trespassing, this is the line you don't cross. But Jesus crosses that line because he goes from asking for water to offering the woman what she truly needs. This is the way I can think of this is like we go in for a checkup, you know, maybe a dental appointment uh, because I'm due for one soon, where you go in for a cleaning, but even if you're just there to get your teeth cleaned, they always take an x-ray. They always do so because they want to see if there's any deeper problems. 
And if there are deeper problems, they need to deal with those things. And so what starts as a simple request for water becomes an opportunity for Jesus to deal with a deeper need of this woman. And so to that deeper need, Jesus offers living water, this phrase living water. And the woman is confused because the, the only water source here is this deep well that you need a bucket to, put, to let down so that you could pull up the water. That's the only source of water that they had. And now Jesus is saying he's gonna provide this living water, but where is he gonna get it from? There's no way that this, this guy can be greater than Jacob who provided this well. Uh, this, our father, Jacob, he made this well, he provided water, he provided life. And she looks at Jesus and says, what can you do? What can you really do? Yet, ironically, it's that same, it's those same things that she doubted about Jesus, that Jesus was offering her. It wasn't physical water that Jesus was talking about, but he was talking about a, a spiritual living water. And you see this phrase living water comes up in the Old Testament, specifically in Leviticus, where this living water was used to clean what was unclean, to restore fellowship that was broken, to bring someone back into the fellowship of God. And we see that this woman who was separated from her people, this is what Jesus is offering. And later in, his gospel, in the gospel of John, John records that Jesus identifies the living water as the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, which is poured out on God's people to unite them to himself as his sons and his daughters, to satisfy that deep thirst for God that Psalm 42, uh, Psalm 63 says, I pant for the waters of God. The Holy Spirit will come and satisfy that desire. See, Jesus is not peddling physical water that we drink and then we become thirsty later. But this living water becomes a spring of water. As Jesus pours out the Holy Spirit, he ex he's extending salvation to the Samaritan woman. He's giving this living water to restore her into full fellowship with God. And this spirit would not only guarantee salvation, but in terms of this spring of water, the spirit also produces things such as the assurance of our salvation. It transforms us to be more Christ-like. It produces the fruit of the spirit as we read through the rest of the New Testament. This is a woman who is desperately in need, who is desperately empty, who is seeking not Jesus, but physical water. But Jesus is offering her the water which restores the truest and most necessary fellowship. So we have to ask, what about us today? Do we ourselves acknowledge that deep spiritual need? Because the Bible tells us that we all have a God thirst. We were created by God for full fellowship and full community with God and one another. And yet it's because of sin that broke those relationships, that corrupted ourselves, that we cannot enjoy that full fellowship with the Holy God. So that this God, so that we're left with this God thirst that nothing in this world can ever satisfy. And when we try to make something good satisfy that, maybe it'll work for a minute. Just like water, it may temporarily satisfy us. But just like water, it will only leave us thirsty, need, needing more water. Whether it be friends, family, career, possessions, none of these ever satisfy. Because as physicist Blaise Pascal, and I'm paraphrasing what he said, he says this, that we have this infinite abyss that can only be filled by an infinite God. We have an infinite abyss that can only be filled by an infinite God. God. And that is what Jesus is offering this woman, the water that she needs. Now here, I have to make one qualification. Jesus is definitely addressing her spiritual need, but he's not saying that we ignore all the tangible needs. The woman definitely needed water to survive. And we see later in John's gospel that Jesus does provide for the needs of the people. In John 6, when he feeds the 5,000 with bread and fish, he does so because he has compassion for them. And throughout the rest of scripture and church history, 
We find Christians providing for tangible needs. Even today, our deacons, they work so hard to administer acts of mercy, to serve the church for the health of it and for the witness of God's love. We're, we're not to ignore tangible needs, the things that we need here physically, but it's clear in John's gospel that these physical needs are not to drown out our spiritual needs. See, we are to prioritize spiritual needs with the living water that we receive, but at the same time, we're not called to neglect the needs that are felt, the tangible needs of our day. And so I just wanted to add that qualification because this is, this is true in the rest of scripture, but we were really focusing on this living water, this living water that we need from Jesus that only can satisfy our deepest and ultimate need. And so Jesus understands this, that she needs this water. But he also needs to reveal that the waters that she was trusting in, the waters that she had, only left her thirsty. And so we're going to turn to that at our second point, the water that we had. From verse 15 to 24. See, the woman in verse 15, she finally bites. She's like, okay, you've told me enough. Sir, give me this water. But notice that she's still just thinking about physical needs. She says, sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty. She wants to avoid this physical thirst. She thinks this is some special water that she doesn't have to drink anymore afterwards, but also that so that she doesn't have to come to this well. And see, there's this source of pain. She says, I don't want to come here to this well, which usually gives water, but for me, is just associated with pain and shame. And so Jesus gets to this when he commands her, go, call your husband, and come here. She doesn't want to come here, but she says, come here. And she quickly responds, I have no husband. And Jesus says, you're right, you don't. Because you've had five already, and the one that you have is not your husband. Now, this, this is the moment when the rest of the story clicks in the sense that this woman, she's isolated from this community. She's separated because she herself was just filled with shame. You know, in those days, husbands were the center of financial and social stability. And some commentators note that even marrying up to three times in order to get that stability was acceptable. But this woman, she married three and went two times over. And even now she's with someone who is not her husband. And John tells us this, Jesus identifies this, but we don't know how she ended up here. Maybe she was promiscuous, desiring to give herself to various men. Perhaps that's where she was at the end, where she's with one who's not her husband. But it's also very possible that she was abandoned by the husbands that she trusted in, as they would have divorced her, to sign a certificate and said, you're no longer mine. I don't have to care for you. Abandoned. Or perhaps they may have just died. The circumstances of life may have been hard on her, and she lost the things that she trusted in. The waters of this marriage and her companionship that promised security and happiness only left her empty and dry. And now she was at a point in life when she was wondering, what hope do I really have? I'm already so deep in. What can ever pull me out? And so Jesus exposes her situation, not to hurt her, but to heal her from it. It's like when we work with kids, sometimes they come with scrapes and cuts. So they hurt themselves and they come to us crying. And before, before we have to you know, comfort them, we also have to deal with the wound. And oftentimes we have to disinfect it and it hurts sometimes when they touch it. And when we put the, the, the stuff on it, I'm forgetting the word for it, but we need to disinfect it. And so kids really don't like it, but this is a necessary step in order to provide healing. In that same way, Jesus exposes this wound in order to heal her with living water. And so the Samaritan woman identifies him as a prophet and she quickly shifts the conversation. She shifts from water to worship and it seems pretty arbitrary. You know, some, some commentators think that she's going on the defensive, trying to, oh, this is too personal, Let, let's switch to something else and talk to abstract. 
while others, they think that she's actually going on the offensive saying, okay, okay, smart guy, you're a prophet. I see that. What about that? Da, 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 da. Whether it's defensive or offensive, what I think John is trying to make here is a connection between the Samaritan woman and actually the people, the Samaritan people. Because the Samaritan woman, she trusted in waters from wells that could not satisfy. And in this conversation about worship, we'll see that the Samaritans trusted in worship that could not save. Wells of salvation that could not give what they promised. So we see this transition from just a Samaritan woman and water to now the people and the worship that can never save them. Because, you know, I, I mentioned earlier that the Jews and the Samaritans, they were very divided, so much so that sometimes rabbis would go around Samaria rather than go through. And this is because in 2 Kings chapter 17, the Samaritans, they were originally Jews of the north. The problem is when they got conquered, other nations came in, brought their religion, and transformed the Jewish religion to be something completely different. It was a mixture of different customs. They only accepted the first five books of the Old Testament scripture. And what we see is that they trusted in their own abilities, in their own knowledge, in their own temple that they built to save them. And so Jesus explains in verse 22 that these Samaritans, they worship what they don't know because they only have this small subset, this small understanding of what God has revealed. Meanwhile, the Jews have been given this fuller revelation through the, through the, you know, the historical books and through the prophets and through the rest of the Old Testament. The Jews were given this fuller revelation to point to a salvation, a salvation that is coming. The salvation isn't about a location where the Samaritans were saying, we worship on this mountain. Jews were saying, we worship in Jerusalem. But the salvation that would come from the Jews in verse 22 would not be a place, but a person. See, verse 23, Jesus teaches her, the hour is coming. And it's now here when true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. And Jesus is not making the distinction where spirit is our hearts and our emotions and what we feel and truth being the mind and the facts that are just, you know, very just cold facts. Jesus isn't trying to separate the, the head, the head and the heart, but what he's saying in spirit and truth is that people, true worshipers will worship according to how God has revealed himself. God, who is spirit, verse 24, who is invisible, this life-giving, creating spirit, he reveals himself. He reveals himself in Christ, the visible manifestation of God, who comes in truth and pours out the spirit as he offers the living water to the woman. So he comes to pour out his spirit on all who believe in him. Christ comes to make true worshipers who worship the Father through the revelation of himself, the Son by the power of the Spirit. The hope, that was, the hope that the Jews had was truly in a person and not a place. And so the woman catches on. She says, oh, I know that the Messiah, the Christ is coming in verse 25. I know that this, this person, this future hope that I have, right now I'm living in shame, but one day when this man comes, it will clarify all things. And yet it's to that future hope that Jesus responds and says, I am that one. I who speak to you and he, I am the Messiah. Well, Christ is proclaiming both to the women who trusted in the wells of the world and the Samaritans trusted in their wells of their worship. Jesus is offering the true well of life, the living water that brings true salvation satisfies our ultimate need of this broken relationship with God. And here Jesus, by saying, I am that one, he's inviting the woman, he's inviting the Samaritans, he's inviting us to trust in him, the giver of living water and life. So you see, thinking about the past year, what wells have we been drawing from? 
what what are we drawing our hope and our ultimate salvation from? Because we're always doing that. Whether we realize it or not, we're drawing from wells either of this world or of somewhere else to satisfy us. This is especially so when we look at the past year and all the genuine pains and disappointments we've experienced. Not just pandemic, but national things, personal things. There's been so many times where we've been We've come up empty, come up thirsty, frustrated. But it is Jesus who gives us that water. It's not good things such as our accomplishments, our relationships, our efforts, our political activism. Those are good things, but they will never satisfy the ultimate need. The only ultimate thing that will satisfy is the living water that Jesus gives. Not the waters that we had from these wells but the waters that we receive from Jesus. So Jesus tells us, stop drawing from those wells. Receive this water that you need. And so the only place that we can receive what we need is by going to the source himself, which leads me to my final point, the water we receive. See, disciples, they finally come back from getting bread in verse 27, and they're surprised to see Jesus talking with this woman. But rather than focusing on the disciples right there, John follows the woman back into the town. She had come out, avoiding people, coming with a water, an empty water jar to get just physical water. But now she left in amazement to those same people she was trying to avoid to bring others to receive the living water of Christ. This is very symbolic. She comes with this jar and she leaves it because she's, she's found the water that's greater than what she came for. And so she calls out in verse 29, come see a man who told me all that I ever did. She's becoming the first missionary to this non-Jewish community. And John tells us that many believed because of what of her testimony in verse 39. Because of what she had said, they believed. And many more believed once they invited Jesus into their town. And they heard him for themselves. And so from these passages, it's really tempting to conclude that John's purpose of including this passage is to call Christians to go evangelize like the woman did. Hey, this woman met Jesus, go out and go out to those places and go evangelize now. And I think that is a genuine application as this whole passage, it anticipates that missions will happen, not just to the Jews, but to the Gentiles. We can see how Jesus engages this woman and learn from that of how to engage non-Christians. But I don't think that's John's primary purpose. Because while, those, while we can see that from the text, thinking about his gospel as a whole, he wants to call all to believe in Christ. His purpose is not to say, Christians, now go and evangelize. But he's saying, come, see who Christ is and believe. Recently at a lunch, uh, I, I was having lunch with a couple of friends and they started talking about French restaurants that they enjoyed. Now, I personally have not been to a true French restaurant, but these friends had gone and they were sharing their firsthand experience about how amazing the restaurant was. That they had experienced it and they're talking about all these names that are too hard for me to pronounce, even the restaurant name, but it would be really foolish of me if I'm sitting there listening to them tell these amazing stories about these dishes and then go and say, hey, I should learn how to be a storyteller like them. I should learn how to share my passion like them. What they're talking about, they're not trying to say, hey, look at me and what I'm doing, but they're trying to say, go go to the restaurant, experience the food yourself. It was that amazing. You go. And so in that same way, the story is not about the Samaritan woman. It's not about the disciples who bring food, but they themselves are confused what Jesus is teaching. All the fingers are pointing towards the central figure of the story, the one that they are witnessing about. All fingers are pointing to Christ. You see, we can understand this because when the Samaritan woman asked that question, can this be the Christ? The English doesn't bring this out, but really in the Greek, she's actually expecting the answer to be no. So if I were to change this question, 
she would say she would be saying it like, "There's no way that this can be the Christ, can it? There's no way that this guy can actually be it." She she herself has doubts, and even the disciples themselves are clueless when they come back with bread, and Jesus tells them that his food is to accomplish the Father's work. The focus is not who the witness is, but to whom they are witnessing about. And we see this with the Samaritans when they come, when they see and taste of his goodness and who Christ is, they they proclaim in verse 42, we have heard for ourselves and we know, we know that this is indeed the savior of the world. No longer are they seeking salvation from their own efforts, from their own worship, from the wells of this world, but they have received living water even a taste of it. And they see that he truly is the savior of the world. And so we ask, can this really be? Can Jesus really be the savior of the world? Can Jesus really be the one that we encounter and who gives us living water that satisfies? And what the rest of John's gospel traces out is, yes, Jesus is, Jesus is the savior because he has accomplished salvation. It's because of the gospel that John writes this account and points all to believe in Christ for eternal life. It's because of this gospel that he calls others to believe. Because Christ came as the perfect son of God to save sinners like you and I. We're all sinners deserving nothing but the wrath of God, drawing from the wells of this world, which could never save us, never satisfy us. But Christ came to a people so undeserving, to a people who were stuck in our sin, unable to save ourselves. He gave his life so that we would have life and that we would receive the Holy Spirit. See, this is the gospel. This is what John wants us to see, not not to do other things, but to come see and believe that this is the Christ. If, if you're not a Christian, you know, under, see this. Even the Samaritans, they see that Christ is the Savior. And I would encourage you, come taste and see who Christ is. And if you are a Christian, and can I encourage you? Let's stop drawing from the wells of this world. Let's stop seeking those wells as if they will satisfy our deepest need. But let us remember the hope that we have in Christ. The Savior of the world has come. And he has come to accomplish salvation. And he has called us as his sons and daughters, giving us the Holy Spirit, the living water that we need to hope in him, to trust in him, to be secured that we are saved in Christ. And so to close, Jesus is the one. Jesus is the one that gives us the living water, which fills us with the hope we need. That living water is the Holy Spirit sealing all who believe as his adopted children. As a church, let us never forget this hope. Even as the world is opening up again, even as we may hope in things of vacations and future plans, let us never forget the hope that Jesus Christ is our Savior. He has given us the Holy Spirit and secures us and has secured us for eternal life. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much just for your word. We thank you so much for Christ in whom we are secured by the Holy Spirit to receive things which truly and ultimately satisfy us. And so we ask, Father, would you help us to really understand and acknowledge our thirst for you, but rather than turning to the things of this world to satisfy them, help us to turn to Christ, to be reminded of the hope we have in him, And from there, experience the joy and the wonderful fellowship of our Savior. And so we thank you. We pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let us respond to the word that we have heard by singing, Come Thou Fountain.
Uh, at this time, we like to set aside this time to, hello, is this working? I cannot see if my audio is working. Okay. Um, if you would like to give uh, online, please, uh, here's the designated website, hopepcsd.org slash give. Thank you for your generosity, especially during these times. And coming up to pray over the offering will be our, one of our deacons, uh, Justinian Park. Let's pray together. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, um, thank you for a great reminder this morning that uh, you are our ultimate provider who provides for our physical and spiritual needs. Uh, thank you for sending your one and only son to offer himself as our living water to satisfy the infinite thirst of our souls. And the only response, proper response for this great gift is for us to share this great hope with our family, friends, and um, our neighbors. So enable us to do that as we seek for your help in overcoming our fear of man. And we also want to pray for our fellow co-laborers who are sharing your hope in Australia, Jim and Claudia. Remind them in the season of weariness and fruitlessness that uh, you are their living water and that you and you alone can satisfy. So grant them faithfulness and grant them strength as they continue to do your gospel ministry. Uh, thank you for this Sabbath day and we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, now we'll go over the announcements uh, fairly briefly. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Welcome to our church. Uh, if it is your first time, we do want to get connected with you. And so you can go to our website and there's like this um, form you can fill out to help us get to know you and our welcoming team will contact you. Um, next. Reflection time. I believe the college group still has a reflections. However, Yag and Tag will be on a break for now. And if I just go like this, just change it. I think this will be our, yes. Uh, our worship continues to be on Zoom every week, every Sunday at 10 a.m. Thank you for everyone who makes all this happen. It's actually a lot of work, um, but we sincerely thank everyone who has been faithful in making this happen. 
Uh, after this, the youth group will end Sparks, which are our little children, children. They, they also have their own separate worships as well. Uh, if you'd like to join, it's at 1130 and uh, respective links are on the Facebook pages. Outdoor worship, we are aiming for the last Sunday of this month, with it, which is the 27th at 3 p.m. Uh, we'll be celebrating the Lord's Supper together there as well. And so if you do plan on coming, I believe there's an e evite, uh, electronic evite that you need to uh, sign up for. And so please be on the lookout for that. Soul by soul, the women of hope have put this together so that different sisters can be able to know one another because sometimes it's hard to break the ice and you need a medium like this to be able to get to know people outside your circle. And so what a wonderful opportunity. If any of you have questions about how the logistics of how this works out, please contact Yojin Kim. Border response and call. Thank you for everyone who volunteered in the migrant shelter, uh, ministering to a lot of these kids. Um, if you want to help further in the future about these events, contact either Daniel Rowe or Mark Chung. Also, uh, we're doing a, a uh, show your love for our neighbors at Monarch School through the garden, garden work on July 17th. Sounds fun. You hang out in the garden, help till the ground, um, it's very therapeutic to be out in nature and do stuff like that. It sounds like a great event for us to even uh, be able to help the community. And so if you are interested in that, please contact one of our elders, Mark Chung. Uh, there will be a Hope PC Diaconate, Hope PC Diaconate Ministry is planning a career event uh, for those of you who are looking for jobs or maybe planning on switching or maybe just want more information about a certain career path. Uh, this will be the time to do it on uh, the 13th, or, or actually please fill out the questionnaire on the 13th so that we can kind of brainstorm together what it is that people need. And then we'll be able to come out with this event tailor made for you guys. And so please help out in filling out those questionnaires. Pastor Joe will be leaving for sabbatical on June 14th, which is tomorrow. And then he'll come back on the 14th, which is just one month. I, I know a, a sabbatical is basically not just the rest aspect, but it's for pastors to really sharpen their skills because when you're doing ministry, it's, it's, 20, it's a 24 seven thing. And um, sometimes you need a break to be able to sharpen your skills a little bit and come back to better serve the church. And that's what Pastor Joe and uh, his wife are going out to do, uh, to really sharp, to rest, sharpen their skills so that they can better serve the church. And I think as a congregation, some of the things that we could do to support this sabbatical first of all, pray for them that they would be, uh, have some time to reflect, have some time to receive rest. And also another thing, practical thing you can do is don't call them, don't contact them, don't text them, don't ask them questions. I'm, I'm just being a little bit facetious, but if you do text them or call them, make it about something encouraging for them. Don't ask them questions or anything. Let them rest, let them enjoy their time. I'm sure that they enjoy your company, but this is a specific time, special time set aside for them to really uh, rest and um, sharpen their skills and reflect. And so we do pray that they would have a blessed time. Men of Hope Bible Study, they're studying the Gospel of John. If you're interested in learning more, please contact uh, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan No and uh, Mark Chung. If you would like to serve, uh, media team is looking for volunteers. Please contact Andrew Hahn. I believe part of media team is things like setting up PowerPoints or uploading videos. And if you feel like that's something right up your alley in terms of skill set wise, or even if it's not, the, it, it's fairly easy for them to help get you uh, up to speed. And so if you're interested in that, contact Andrew Hahn. That's it for the announcement. It now comes for the doxology. And so if you guys, wherever you guys are at, if you could all stand. I'm a little bit, yeah, I haven't uh -huh. sung in a while the doxology out loud. So please excuse my voice. Shall we? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise him all creatures here below. Praise him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. 
Amen. Receive the blessings of the Lord. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who offers living water, the love of God the Father who embraces us, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore. Amen. Friends.